late May 2019, we released our first ever documentary, an hour-long road trip deep into New England to learn more about what might be the most exciting brewing scene in the world. Whilst there, we learned there was so much more to it than juicy IPA, lobster rolls and cues for cans. In fact, we visited five completely different breweries that could claim to be the greatest in the world at what they do. So over the next few weeks, we're going to give them the coverage they deserve by using all the amazing stories they had that didn't make it into the documentary. This week, it's the turn of Notch Brewing in Salem. Nearly 10 years ago, Notch Brewing Co. put themselves out there as an American session beer brewer. In a market saturated with huge IPAs and stouts, they wanted to make beer that you could have a few of, the kind of beer where you say, another of the same at the bar. That naturally led to lager, and founder Chris had a pretty similar Eureka story to us about Pilsner. Since then, Notch have, in our opinion, gone on to become one of the world's best lager breweries, helping to elevate one of our favorite styles and bringing that relaxed, Bavarian-style drinking culture to North America. Of all the breweries we visited in New England, this was the one we found hardest to leave. So I'm here with Chris, founder of Notch, um, and even doing brewing today. There's not a lot of founders that get to do that these days. No, uh, I still jump in the brew house once in a while. This week, twice, we had a brewer go down with a shoulder injury, so I'm filling the gaps. Yeah. And I don't mind that at all. No, you get to get your hands dirty and remember what it's like to be loading in the malt bags. And... Uh, it's what I love, but I think any brewer that starts their own company realizes after a while you get away from the brew house pretty quick and you start <laughs> running the company. So it's always a joy to get back in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So tell me, I mean, we're, we're in a slightly unusual, unusual place for maybe Czech lager, German lager, um, particularly given that you're nine years old, like that's quite an old company. Where did the inspiration come for that? Uh, I've been brewing since 1993 professionally. And in 2005, I took my first trip to the Czech Republic and I sat in the Golden Tiger in Prague and had an epiphany about beer. And that changed everything. And I was really American ale, British ale guy. And I had that, that Pilsner Kell from the tank on pasteurized and it changed my life. And since then, I've, you know, uh, Germany and Czech Republic really been my inspiration for brewing because I love the beer so much. And technically, they're so challenging. Yeah. They're very, very challenging. And I love that process challenge where the ingredients are important, but the process really uh, is so influential over the final beer. Uh, and as a brewer, that's what we love to do. We love process. So I presume you didn't start out like this, like this incredible space. You must have started much smaller nearby. So I started Notch in 2010. And when I did that, uh, because I've been brewing in the Boston area for a long time, I knew a bunch of brew brewery owners. And I started on this concept of modest alcohol beer at a time when high alcohol beer was really driving the market in Massachusetts. And so I wanted to prove the con this, this, this concept out that, you know, Czech lager, German lager is a modest strength would have legs before I built a brewery. And so I did that for four years, five years at other breweries in the area using their equipment in either contract or, or gypsy brewing as it used to be called. Yep. And then we proved out that Notch was successful. We brewed a 10,000 barrel brand and this was, it was easy to build this place at that point because we knew we had the customers. So I want to mitigate risk. I do want to open the doors with a new brand and new beers and hope it went well. I wanted to make sure we, we got ahead of it. So the response was awesome when you were coming out with four and a half percent lagers and stuff like that. It wasn't a hard sell because maybe in some markets you'd be like, I brew lager and people are like, what is lager? It Where? wasn't easy, but because we were one of very few doing it, we had a, we had a, uh, we had a runway before everyone else got into it. Yeah. And just on Facebook today, it popped up that our beer was being served in 2011, our, our Czech pills at Deep Ellum in Boston, one of the better beer bars in the area of the country. And so we, we, we've been at that beer for eight years now. And now it's only now that you know every hazy IPA brewer is starting to put out a lager. We came out and was like, what are you doing, right? Lower ABV, no one's gonna buy that. Well, people value that because they want to sit in a beer hall and have three or four, right? And then go to dinner and not fall asleep. So I, I think the diversity here has really, really driven uh, lager's acceptance because people are looking for more than just, you know, uh, hazy IPA, pastry, stout, and sour. Our scene's much bigger than those three dominant styles right now in craft beer. Yeah. I feel like also in this region, a lot of the, the brewers we've been talking to have been obsessives. So you had that, that Golden Tiger moment. Uh, some people got obsessed with the New England IPA style. The variety comes from the fact that all of you guys are very provenance driven or very style driven and drilling right down into these different styles um, and kind of 
really championing one particular thing that you guys love doing, which seems like very New England. It's like, this is what I love and this is what I do. I never really thought about that, but this is definitely true. Again, Allagash, you know, they're, they're driven yeah. by a very... So I love Whitmere. I'm going to brew it and see what happens. A very singular focus, which yeah. is, and they've been true to it for a long, long time. And yeah, for us, it was, it was, it was lager. I mean, it was also, I mean, we also produced the New England style pale ale session IPA and IPA because we do love that beer. Um, so we, we, have a, we have a broader base than just lager, but lager definitely is, if you put us in the corner, and you, we'll tell you it's lager. Yeah. Um, but when you start to narrow, have that narrow focus, you really get into the minutia and details of that style. And we, we, when I was planning this place, I wanted to make sure everything we had from an equipment standpoint allowed us to do anything we wanted to do. So we have a decoction brewery that can do double, triple decoction. We have open fermenters like you would find in Bavaria or the Czech Republic. We have horizontal lagering tanks. We do natural carbonation either through spunding or croissant. So we have all these, these tools that we can use because we're geeks about it. Because I thought ahead, like we need to have all these tools to make the very, very best beer we can. Because I hear now a lot of people coming to me say, hey, I want to do decoction, how do I do it? It's like, you're out of luck. Your yeah, system's, your system's so. not set up for that. You can't even fake it. So, you know, so for us, it was, it was really that, that narrow focus of lager that allowed us to build a place to, to do whatever we want. Yeah. So there's a lot of flexibility here in, lo in the lager world as well. Yeah, I think that's something that people kind of forget. People think of lager and they think of macro lager. They think of this one star, which is sort of based off of a, off of a pilsner has gone slightly wrong. But you guys can fill most of a beer board just with different styles of lager. Is that going to be important for, for lager going forward to show that? I don't, I, we've, we've heard every year that you know, lager is going to be the next big thing. Year of the lager. Yeah. The year of the lager. It hasn't really happened, but it's been this gradual move towards uh, crisp, clean, ref refreshing. That's not a bad word. Um, lagers that are flavorful. Yeah, it's used as a euphemism a lot. Like, oh, that's refreshing. What yeah. they mean is it's it's clean and not a lot going on. Yeah, but it, when it's a great lager, it's also really nuanced. When you drill down, you go, well, there's there's the cochin caramel thing. There's the you know sars kind of aromatic strawberry fresh grass thing going on and yeah and all this kind of stuff which because yeah. it doesn't bat you in the face people don't think about yeah and you get those uh, on the aromas like the, the, we do uh german hellas we do a five percent version then we do the export strength of 5.7 percent and you talk about a nuanced beer and so we've done a bunch of process um tweaking to make sure that beer can be has that fresh malt character of of grapes and honey so we, we open from it all our lagers that are, that are Czech and then the appropriate ones that are German. So that's at the other side? No, here. We walked right by it. So we'll do that to about 40% uh, attenuation left and we rack it into a close so we can harvest the yeast yep. and then do, and spun it for natural carbonation. But the geometry of that tank is it's as wide as it is tall. And so it's an ester producer for lager. So the lager character comes out even more. It's a good way to get rid of some sulfur as well. Um, but the, the, the yeast behaves a little bit differently, and the, the ester formation is a little bit different. Um, and so the beer is just, a, just, again, that one little nuance. Does the consumer know that? I don't know, but as brewers, we know that we've done that, and then, you know, it's up for everyone else to decide. And as, as, as palates mature and get more diverse, like, it's often said that people get into IPA, get into stouts, get into sours, and then they end up back at lager, where their, their palate is changing, they're picking out these nuances that maybe they didn't the first time around when they were drinking yeah. the bigger beers? It, it, it takes a while because we're, we've been so enamored with the brute force, especially in the United States. I saw it in England when I was in Manchester at the Indie Man um, Fest too. That we've been so enamored with brute force and intensity of flavor that you know, when you move to, to a new nuanced style, it, it takes some recalibrating of your palate to understand that you know, and, and to like, oh, I understand what these nuances are. I mean, it's easy to go to a festival and say, oh, I'm going to try 40 variants of an IPA. When's the last time we went to a festival and said, I'm going to try 40 variants of a Pilsner? We have one, right? Like, oh, that was refreshing and great. But how is that different from the other 30 Pilsners that you might be able to have that day and really get an understanding of that? And that's, that's what we try to do here. We have a 4% beer called a Tenor, which is basically the 10 Plato Czech lager. And we have a 4.4% uh, Czech lager, which is 12 Plato. Yep. And those are, they're slightly different, but you can, the differences are real. And one's a little bit drier, one's more, crushable and refreshing, lack of better terms, and one has a little bit more body to it, right? And each one's good at a different time. Like if I'm brewing, I come out here and I get, I get a liter of tenor right after I'm done. Because I don't want to get drunk, but I definitely want to, I'm going to, that rate of consumption is going to be pretty high for me. 
I'm going to get to that liter like I would for a half liter. Um, and then I'll move to the 12 plate. I'll, I'll relax a little bit. Yeah, no one finishes a shift and has a double IPA. Like, yeah, it's like in the wine world where they say it takes a lot of great beer to make wine. It, it takes a lot of great lager to make ale. I think it's probably fair to say. I think there's a clear reason why a lot of brewers who were focused on, I, I'm not, this, this is not derogatory either, but because um, I love, I, def, I defend New England IPA more than anybody for someone who really doesn't make that much of it. Um, uh, I think there's a reason why uh, you see a lot of um, IPA brewers moving to produce lager because they want to drink it. Yeah. They, they, brewers get it. They understand it, right? So they, they, they want that to be successful because they want to drink it after they're done. Yeah. Right? So, I, yeah. On board with that. I want, to drink a, I want to drink a refreshing, clean beer when I'm done with work. Um, you said that you have a little, like, you, you, it's come to the point where people are excited by lager again. Um, is, is, is that going to be a trend? I'm not going to say it's going to be a year of the lager, but do you think that the markets started to, the, the bubble started to accept lager as a, a, or Pilsner and Hellas as legit, very exciting styles? So here's the conversation I've been having with a lot of people in that people always talk about lager or Pilsner being the ent a, a gateway or entry level beer versus like a more aggressive, highly hopped New England IPA, and I totally disagree with that. Because you think about the flavors and aromatics that are coming from those two, two beers, no one comes out of the womb lo loving Pilsner. Those are, those are flavors and aromatics that you need to learn to enjoy, whether it be pepper or cedar in the aromatic, or the flavor of dry. And then you think about New England IPA, it's sweet and juicy and citrus. That's the palate of a 12-year-old. Yeah. So we're providing beers that appeal to a 12-year-old's palate, and that's a pretty wide you know, uh, market, where Pilsner has a much more defined one. You, people have to get acquainted to those flavors. Brad and I recently did a, a Czech brewery tour, Kautska, Unitizia. Oh, that's my favorite brewer of all time. Yeah? Yeah. We are. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, I was done, really, because those two were what we love. Like, we love like it's almost like tonic kind of dryness and herbalness from their best uh, 10 degree Plato yeah. beer. Um, we've never really had beer like that and it's not what people think about when they think about lager. And yet when people think it's a, a, an entry level beer, they don't know that on your titular are there producing these beers that somewhere between a gin and tonic and a lager, like they're just so dry and so crisp and so Moorish. Moorish. Just I, I had one of the best beer drinking experiences in their tap room where uh, Max Bavero, who's the, the, the Czech beer writer, uh, he, he said, hey, come out, I'll, I'll bring you out there. So I, I met him, he navigated us to get to the, the tap room. This was maybe five years ago. And we sat across from each other at one of the communal tables and had eight, ten Play-Doh beers. I think we snuck in a 12 somewhere just to try it. Over the course of two hours, and we both kind of looked at each other like, yeah, I think we're done. We paid the tab and, and left. And we both watched, you know, a straight line to the bus. It was all good. But again, that, that's like one of those moments where like, this is why Czech Pilsner is so fantastic. Yeah. They didn't call it Pilsner if you're outside of Pilsner. It's, it's pale lager, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that, that brewed more than, other, than any other. Like, I, that 10 Plato beer was like my equal to Pilsner Kell at Golden Tiger. Like, in terms of a 4% beer can be this wildly flavorful and clean and complex, yeah, just an amazing place. Do you ever compare what you produce here to what's being produced in the Czech Republic? Are you looking to compete with those guys or are you looking to be a little bit different? Um, that's a really good question. I, I never want to be a me too. I'm never trying to replicate something. I'm trying to make sure, I want to be able to make sure that I could make those beers the way they're made and then put our little touch on it, yeah. whatever that may be. I, I've talked about this before. I don't really like riffs on everything. Like if you come up and make a riff on something, so well, let, try to make it as it is and understand how to make it that way and then do it in a way that's your own. Um, so what we did with the standard was I tried to make what I thought was um, the Czech Pilsner. And then instead of using Saz, we used Sterling just to give it a little bit different profile. Um, and so it gives a little more lemon than you would find in a Saz. Uh, but then when we did Tenor, which is our 10 plate beer, that's all sauce. Because F it, that's what I want to do, right? I want to have this straight up, straight up, you know, check session Pilsner at that, at that kind of um, strength, but also in those, those same kind of nuanced flavors you would find in the Czech Republic. So we're not trying to copy the Czech Republic, but we're 
we're pretty damn close. We just want to put little little our influences on it. But we're not going to dry up with fucking mosaic or citron and pilsner. No, if I see like New World hot pilsner. Do I look like, angry? No. Do I do I look no, angry no, no. about that? <laughs> So, if there's one thing I really dislike, is calling something X when it's not. Like, if you come out with a Pilsner and you dry up with Citra, it's like, what the fuck are you doing? You're confusing everyone who's never had a Pilsner before, yeah. thinking it's supposed to smell like cat pee. Like, it's just, it's a, it's a debasement to the style. It really is. So, like, dial it back in and put your spin on it, but don't make it something totally different. Just call it something else. If you want to dry hop a Pilsner with Citra, cool. Mosaic, fine. Just call it something else. Don't call it a Pilsner. That's, a, that's an affront to Pilsner. Am I in a soapbox right now? No, I kind of <laughs> Chris and I could have gone on for hours. In fact, we did. We had a few more beers, a few games of skee-ball, and then dinner, during which we continued to geek out about all the intricacies of lager and lager life. This search for nuance, but also the perfect beer, the one that you can't stop ordering pint after pint. That's what we believe Good Pilsner gives you more than any other style. And if you don't believe us, you need to go to Notch. <laughs>